Thanks so much, everyone, for the opportunity. I'm Dave, co-founder and CEO of Aleo. So if we look at uh, what is becoming more prevalent in the public consciousness is that kidney failure is such an immense burden. If you take not only the large numbers of patients that have chronic kidney disease, the sequelae at the end is dialysis, and over 3 million people worldwide require dialysis. And despite these fact that these are very complex patients, they have some pretty otherwise common uh, issues that they struggle with, such as heart failure, which is a leading complication. And they suffer from being spending almost two weeks each year in the hospital. And so despite being the fact that they're a very small number of the overall patient population, something like Medicare, they're a tremendous amount of the outsized cost. And what we've seen is, whether here or around the world, if I can go one slide back, whoops. Uh, what we've seen both here and around the world is that there are folks that are trying to address that lack of data with some pretty labor-intensive manual processes. So even though CMS mandates that these patients are monitored because they're trying to get more data about these patients, providers are taken to their own hands. Our friends over the National Health Service of the UK were in fact sending nurses out 50 miles each way to patients' homes twice a week to do a point of clear blood draw, even though they get a monthly blood draw anyway in the clinic. And what they saw is, by taking intermittent monitoring and making it more frequent, that they could reduce the cost of hospitalizations and the number of visits to the ER. But obviously, as you might expect, that's pretty expensive, and they needed a better non-invasive remote way to do that, and they turned to Aleo to do so. So Aleo is a end-to-end um, -end remote patient monitoring platform that delivers clinically actual metrics to the clinician. As you might imagine, it does start off with a patch. It's shower-proof, sweat-proof, has about a month-long battery life as well. The patient wears it throughout their whole day. They don't have to touch it, don't have to interact with it. Whenever they get within about 100 feet of a bedside hub, whether at their home, whether at the clinic, that data is automatically uploaded to the cloud where we run our series of proprietary algorithms on it and we push it out into a clinically actionable alert that fits in seamlessly into the clinical workflow, really reducing the burden uh, for both the patient and the clinician at the end of the day. What underlies our technology and our ability to really push our capabilities is the fact that we do things a little bit differently. So there's 16 sensors, the big workhorse is the optical. But we have a patented way of not just looking at the cap capillary bed like most of the folks, whether in the commercial world or the clinical world as well, by effectively getting a 3D holographic image of the underlying vessel. And that gives us a really interesting advantage when it comes to making sure that A, we're zero calibration, that there's an AI backend that's continuing to learn on some of the hemodynamic parameters and blood metrics that we're able to get as well. What, once again, our capabilities continue to expand. As you might expect, we have your basic vitals, such as heart rate, temperature, SpO2, but also some of the key issues that these patients really struggle with. So for example, I mentioned heart failure. So 40% of dialysis patients are, heart, are hospitalized for heart failure in any given year, and we're able to monitor that through both what they do today in terms of the blood draw, so a hemoglobin hematocrit, we're doing that continuously, and also blood pressure as well. If we look at their lifeline of their vascular access, has a very high risk of failure, high number of interventions, on average almost three a year per patient. We're looking at not just the volumetric blood flow, which is what clinicians are used to seeing about once a quarter right now, but also the ability to look at a blockage anywhere along the entire upper extremity. And last but not least, uh, what we've also done is start to get into biomolecules and other biomarkers as well. Uh, looking at something like potassium, we're about to, what will be public is we actually won a groundbreaking cardiovascular award that'll be announced publicly next uh, week uh, for this. And it'll be really exciting in that Potassium can now be measured non-invasively at over greater than 91% specificity and sensitivity. And that's really important, because everything that we do, we take the hospital grade to home. If we look at something like hemoglobin hematocrit, this is with patients getting a box delivered to their home, placing the patch themselves, and we're still doing better than any of the non-invasive uh, or even uh, finger sticks as well. What that means is, while we look at reducing the cost of both hospitalizations, reducing the number of uh, interventions as well. If you look at ancillary costs like drug costs, we can see from this vignette, we had a patient that's on uh, a very expensive drug that is common to dialysis patients like Epigen. They had it titrated up because they thought the hemoglobin was low. We actually were able to determine that their hemoglobin was spiking, and three weeks before they were scheduled for another blood draw, we caught it in advance, they went to their doctor, had it titrated down, and we could have saved the cost of not only the confirmatory blood draw, but a very expensive drug as well. 
And what that means is that there's a really exciting transition happening in what has otherwise been an often neglected uh, space due to the fact that it's been very typically confined into a fee-for-service uh, bundle, there's now a big transition to value-based care. And that's all coming online in January 1st of next year, so we really ha have a lot of wind in our sails and moving into the value-based arena and also into a big push towards home where RPM closes that loop of care. So there are reimbursement codes that are now available uh, for this patient population, and there's a great uh, way to not only have what's existing today, but to push that higher as CMS reevaluates that in a couple years, and our subscription model on a PMPM basis, which already has a strong margin now, we believe will have even a stronger margin as we continue to showcase value. There's value not only for the physician, the patient, the provider, and the payer, so there's a very strong alignment, and everybody is also able to get involved in the innovation by seeing some new revenue that drops to their bottom line, whether they're a fee-for-service, an IDN, or a capitated. And as you might imagine, we certainly are focusing on the IDNs and capitated as our early market partners, but there are fee-for-service folks that are lining up and saying to us, how do we get involved? All of our partners have some skin in the game, whether that's direct investment or offsetting the cost of our clinical trials, and it has really created a very robust pipeline of about 120,000 patients in our partnership pipeline, which is a little over $150 million worth of revenue, and we need about a quarter of that to hit cash flow break even. So it's a really exciting opportunity uh, to move in. We're getting our, our partners are starting to introduce us uh, to other health systems as well and pulling us horizontally into clear adjacencies like heart failure in the ICU in addition to a reven current revenue generating contract uh, with the U.S. military as well. So we really feel like we get a chance. We certainly stand on the shoulders of giants. Please don't get me wrong. But if you look at RPM today, there's a lot of device fatigue if you get a lot of different devices that you have to use all the time or maybe only being able to get some of the metrics that you need. But by focusing on a patient population and giving all the metrics that are really meaningful, we found a really positive reception in the marketplace so far. And that really provides an amazing launching pad to really get pulled into other areas of the cardiovascular world and continue to increase our opportunities. Helping all of this become commercial is an amazing team. Uh, we're a little over 25 people split between San Francisco and Boulder. Uh, quite a few startup exits uh, under the team's belt, and uh, really both from both high-tech and med device folks. Our most recent addition uh, was a former uh, Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, just joined our board as well, so really excited about how that can help us, uh, some of the challenges that we'll certainly see over the next couple years, we can help tackle that. Uh, we're about to close around in the next couple weeks. That'll bring our total uh, raise to a little over $30 million to date. We'll be back in the marketplace uh, sometime in the next year to really increase that uh, growth around uh, the commercialization that we're doing and really continue to lean into those partners. So very excited about the Leo story, uh, the ability to take world-class wearables, generate clinically actionable data, and seamlessly integrate into the clinical workflow. So excited to speak to, with uh, all of you later uh, today. So thanks so much again.